please welcome to Let's Talk. Laura, you're a plus size model. Uh, you've done environmental science and a law degree. Sarah, what, you've solved the sugar problems of 600,000 people worldwide? Oh, I like to think so at times. <laughs> um, you were also a model briefly, is that right? Oh, Helen, um, yes, um, very briefly, in sort of my late teens, early 20s. It, it earned good money at the time, mm -hmm. it got me overseas. <laughs> but so began not so much a battle with body image, um, hyper-awareness. But you have had your battles with body image, haven't you? Yeah, I have, absolutely. Um, it was, I mean, it's, it stemmed for me, not so much from body image per se, in the traditional sense that, you know, I was trying to lose weight because it would fit into certain clothing or ideals about, about sort of what a woman should look like. It had, for me, a lot to do with my anxiety and to do with um, my sense of control which was stemming from my, um, my anxiety as a teenager and, and, and in my early 20s. I'm, I'm definitely going to come back to anxiety mm. and stress with you because I do think it's an absolutely fascinating area. But I want to um, come to you, Laura, and uh, tell your story. You were going to a, a casting with your sister, who was a size 8, um, and you came away with a, not only a modelling career but one of the biggest plus-size modelling careers in this country. So... How did you feel when, uh, or, and to your sister, I guess, when you ended up becoming the, the model in the family? Yeah, it was uh, definitely unexpected. It wasn't something that I had ever set out to achieve, let alone think I could do or want to do. I was studying a science degree and a law degree, and all I wanted to do was be a scientist and work in a lab and be outside and study the ocean. And it's I almost was... a cliche, isn't it? Oh, totally. The, they... the model who, who was, you know, an environmental scientist. Yeah, but the complete... you were actually that. <laughs> exactly, yeah. And it's a complete juxtaposition, but I'm running with it. <laughs> and, I, yeah, I was in New York with my sister and I got approached by a few model scouts and they said, oh, you know, you're a plus-size model. And I... I wanted to punch everyone in the face. <laughs> I, um, Were you offended? Yeah, completely. No, I One, I didn't know what a plus size model was. I didn't know they existed. Um, my sister was the model in the family. I was the scientist. And basically, I just thought they were calling me fat. Um, and were they? No, not at all. It was, that was my perception, though, of the word plus, plus size. Um, so what is a plus size model? Because... We have this, this debate in the weekly that we prefer to call you curvy than plus size because there's a certain stigma with plus size. Is that, do you feel that? Yeah. Um, what I try to tell people is that plus size models are called plus size models because we are plus four to six sizes bigger than a standard model. However, we're not plus size in reality. Uh, that's where the negative kind of connotations come from and the real um, disparities come from with between reality and the modelling industry. I get called out on not being called... I shouldn't be called plus size and I'm not plus size enough. But, <laughs> yeah, I know, it's crazy. And, you know, I, I guess in a way it's kind of skinny shaming the plus size models. But, um, you can't I win, know. can you? No, 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 we can never win. Uh, but for me, I am a plus size model. I'm not a plus size person. Mm -hmm. um, I sell garments, I work well as a model, and the fashion industry is a business. It works off people buying the clothing. So you need and to have people And we know buying. that most women in Australia are not um, size 8, 10 or even 12, yeah. are they? Most, most women in Australia are actually looking for bigger sizes. Exactly. The average size in Australia is between a 14 and a 16 and I'm a size 14. I have been since I was 14 years old. I haven't changed sizes and I, you know, I do sell the clothing and that's what people want in the fashion industry. They want to sell their clothing and if my body does that, then that works for them. Let's talk about anxiety because 18% of Australian women are suffering from anxiety. Mm, I, I can completely believe it. It's the new depression, you know, to put it crudely. Um, Is it the same thing or are they just linked? Well, I, I think they're linked. Um, I don't know that they're the same thing. I think you can have an anxious depression. Um, anxiety is generally associated with quite a elevated sort of mental activity and um, sort of cellular activity. Um, depression generally with kind of, you know, a much slowed down kind of um, form of stress, I suppose. Um, but yes, um, I think that with depression was the discourse for mm. a good 20, 30 years now. Yeah. I mean, we grew up in an era where in the 90s, I remember the early 90s, you know, sort of prior to Prozac Nation and all that kind of dialogue, um, it all became fairly new, I think, when we were growing up. You know, I certainly know that in my teenage years, depression wasn't something talked about. Mm. I think now... 
but realising that a lot of people, it's, it, it, it is in fact but, anxiety. But, but anxiety is a... It's quite a physical response. You, 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 you get heart palpitations. You mm. feel like you're going to throw up. It's, it's completely debilitating. That's what you suffer from. Yeah, I do, and I've, I've, I've suffered from various um, versions of it, or you know, manifestations of it, from a very young age. It's really only been the last couple of years. I've found some peace with it. Um, and really? Yeah, yeah. I accept that I am an anxious person, and I think one of the worst things that you can do to an anxious or stressed or even depressed person is to say stop being stressed yes you know relax yeah. yes. you know calm down yeah, yeah calm down, calm down um, because I know that that's what I used to get told when I was younger mm. and of course I got more stressed about the fact that I couldn't mm. find a way to get less stressed and then I'd see everybody else coping and I thought that I had missed out on the guidebook to life you also have a thyroid issue so does that play into stress and anxiety for you or is that a whole other range of my thyroid condition is um, a symptom of my anxiety, right. it was caused by chronic stress, it's chronic and acute stress. Um, sort of, I think it started at 11 when I got my first autoimmune disease, then at 21, 27, and then again at 36, all different autoimmune diseases. And um, so I think it's a symptom, but then of course, it's a terrible, terrible catch 22. Um, you know, Hashimoto's the thyroid uh, and that's disease. What I have as I've well. got, you've got it as well. Um, you've got Hashimoto's as yeah. well. Yeah, and I've had that since I was 13. Yeah, right. Mm -hmm. That's really young yeah. to be... To, to have so, what are you, so what are your symptoms? Um, well, now that I'm on medication and since I have been, they've pretty much all gone away, but I really notice when I do get tired, um, I slur my words if mm. my levels aren't right uh, and really dry skin. Dry skin and dry hair all the time. Yeah. I'll never, they'll never be fixed. So both of you um, women are in the public eye, um, both very well known, so you know all about um, the way magazines present women. I mean, with Cosmo and with Australian Women's Weekly, it's great the fact that they are using plus size models and the fact that they don't even say it's a plus size model, yeah. it's just there for people to see. It's not labelled, it's not titled, it's just here's another beautiful it's part woman. of the wallpaper. Yeah, mm. and, and I really enjoy the fact, and I find great privilege in the fact that I have been able to be in both of those magazines as a model, as an editorial model, mm. which is something that doesn't come around very often for plus size models. Still. Still. <laughs> Still. So Robin Lawley and yourself haven't changed that environment? No, I mean, it's slowly changing, but not to the extent where it needs to be, where it is, um, where it's not actually, it needs to be at a point where it's not celebrated anymore. Mm. Um, it's not stigmatised. Yeah, and, and, yeah. and that's what I'm finding. I mean, I just shot a campaign for The Upside and that was amazing because they used a Victoria's Secret model and then they used me as one of their models, which mm. is, you know, a great privilege as well. But the fact that we have to go and celebrate these achievements is still kind of like, well, you know, why isn't it just seen as normal? Well, what do you think when you read today that France is thinking about legislating um, against skinny models. Yeah, I've seen mm. that. I mean, living in New York for a few years and being with quite a well-known agency over there, um, you know, in and out with skinnier models all the time and living with some, um, yeah, it goes to the extremes. There's, you know, no food being eaten, um, prescription dietary pills, uh, agents telling girls that, you know, they're only allowed to have one cracker and a couple of glasses of water in the lead up to fashion mm. week per day. And, you know, it's it's completely unhealthy and not only for their body but mentally as well because these girls are going to the extremes to look like that, then not being booked on any jobs and then living with a plus size model who's working every single day and <laughs> comparing themselves yeah. to me who's eating really healthy and, you know, I, I eat healthy, I work out but, you know, I'll let myself have um, a treat every now and then and have a glass of wine and whatever, but they couldn't fathom the fact that, you know, they were putting themselves through so much stress mm. and I was so happy with myself. What more does Sarah Wilson need or want to achieve? I just want to make this life count. You know, I think that when I got sick the last time, sort of in my early, more well, mid-30s, I came close to not really being able to continue my life and I, it was a wake-up call. What do you mean by that? Um, well, a couple of things, and, you know, obviously my anxiety brought me to a point where I couldn't quite see the existential point of continuing. Um, but also my, my illness was such a... It got quite to quite a crucial point. My heart was under quite a bit of pressure and 
and as, as you know, I um, went for sort of nine to 12 months without working or even really having, leaving, being able to leave the house. You don't have to answer this, and I've known you for a long time, but I've never heard you actually say that you had that moment in time. What are you talking about? Are you talking you were so sick that you didn't know whether you were going to live, or were you in that pit of depression it that was, you thought it was time to do something drastic? It was, um, it, it was a combination of both. The two conflated. The two were just um, all I had yeah. at that moment. I was very lonely. Um, it's incredible how... Um, the incredible people that come out of the woodwork... It's quite often relative strangers who come out and support you during those times. But I was essentially very alone. People get on with their lives, you know. I didn't have family nearby. I don't have a husband, children. Um, but, um, yeah, it was, it was a moment where I just couldn't see a way out. I couldn't see any, you know, light at the end of the tunnel. But I think it was also... I've always had a, quite a spiritual, philosophical slant to the way I do things. And if I couldn't see what was the way out. I just couldn't see the point. It was quite a... It wasn't like I... It wasn't like a dramatic thing. It was actually a very calm, sort of rational um, and very spiritually sort of based end point. Cul-de-sac. Is that from that really good Catholic upbringing you had? <laughs> <laughs> um, I think I probably should wrap up. Sarah, what does success look like to you now? Um, success is about being able to do everything that fires me up mm -hmm. um, and, if I can use this language, giving a shit. So, yes, while ever I can continue to be my message, um, I think that will be my sort of guide for success. Laura, you've got so much of your life ahead of you, but what does success look like to you? I think, for me, um, success is being happy with myself, uh, happy with how I look, happy with how I feel, how I am mentally. I'm happy with where I'm at now, but I have such a big, such a, a big picture that I want to accomplish mm -hmm. that for me, if I get halfway through it, then I'll be happy and successful. And that really has to do with the environment and um, I guess influencing those people in my sphere mm -hmm. around me and a wider one if I can get that too. Laura Wells, Sarah Wilson, there's food out there. You can both go and have We've something to eat. We've already. Um, <laughs> thank you both for joining us. Thank, thank you. you.